All right, hello and welcome to Sonoma County Wildlife Rescue and our weekly live stream. Uh, plan A was to start talking all about skunks today, but there's a lot going on at the center. So we're going to have to adjust our sequence. There's a lot going on. Uh, and so we were just finishing looking at this juvenile, Myotis bat. So we do have seven or so different species of bats that we'll encounter here in Sonoma County. Um, all of the bats are insectivorous, uh, and so if you're ever lucky enough to have a bat swirling around your head at dusk, they tend to come out at dusk and dawn, then those bats are doing you a favor because they are eating the mosquitoes that are coming towards you. So they all are insectivorous. And so, um, hi little fellow, okay, yes, hi. And so um, these bats do have quite a bit, not only do they have webbing around their wings, but they also have webbing towards the tail. And so they don't have a free tail like some of the other species. They do have a tail that will function as a net to scoop up those insects midair. Now I'm just gonna go ahead and let him have his piece. So I'm just gonna fold this to, so it's a little cave for him. Let it hang, Ooh, okay, there we go. Let it hang down smooth. And so, and then so this is the type of enclosure we'll use for a lot of juvenile bats. And so I'm just gonna fold it down, have them be a little bit further down as I put the top on. There we go. So our bat's right in the middle of that cloth, and this is how they like to hang out. They like a nice narrow spot. Um, and so the, we just give a couple folds of the towel, and that will be sufficient for them to, to feel comfortable and snug within the folds there. So our little bat is hanging out in the middle of their folds. You can barely see him in the outline. He does have his option of heat as need be. Um, and so, um, so please let me know if you can hear us clear and clear and true. Uh, we'll, when we have people close, I'll put my mask back on, but as long as we can stay several feet apart, I'll just be able to try to be more articulate. Uh, here at Sonoma County Wildlife Rescue, it's been another busy spring week. We still have about 150 patients on site. Uh, we've had some more come in, but we've actually had some more, some of our earlier intakes be released. So some of those early opossums are actually back out in the wild. So we're hitting the point where we're kind of having a steady flow in terms of our population. Um, we did bring, get in not just one, but six barn owl chicks. Now these barn owl chicks were found out in uh, hay that was actually shipped from out of state. So there's no way we're gonna be able to return them to their original nest. So later today, um, part, of my, part of what we'll do is we'll be placing these guys in some of the barn owl boxes we manage as fosters. So let's just take a look at these barn owl chicks and so hi hello little ones and so you can see there's a variety of ages and so these would have all come from the same nest uh, with barn owls when they lay eggs they'll just the parents will lay the eggs and start incubating even though as they keep on laying and so they'll they'll be at a couple days apart each in terms of their maturation uh, and so you can hear the typical sweet barn owl sound um, and another task that we just need to take care of this morning, so we'll end up doing it on live stream, is we have another, this time adult, western screech owl that's here. And this western screech owl, uh, we're worried about its eyes. We want to see if there's any ulcerations to its eyes, so we're going to do a quick evaluation, including a fluorescing stain, to see if those eyes are indeed, uh, have defects on the surface or not. Uh, and so Megan, you're going to grab our friend. So last week we showed you a juvenile, um, uh, Western screech owl. Uh, this week it's an adult, and as you will see, the size on the adults is about the same. Now we will get to our skunks later today. We just had a couple tasks we needed to take care of on a busy rehab day. All right, so this is our full-grown adult Western screech owl. We're actually going to hang out in that darker corner for the stain to work best. And so, there we go. so, and then this is—is is this saline here? No. All right, is it LRS? Yeah. Okay, that's fine. There's um, more up there too. There's more to this? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, good. Um, all right, so with the way we evaluate if there's an ulcer to an eye is actually a chemical you may have seen from human optometry. This is fluorescein. And so it is a chemical that when exposed to black light will glow. And so we just put a little bit on each eye. Now, if the surface of the eye, if the cornea is healthy and intact, that stain will just roll right off. If there's a defect to the eye, then it will pick up that stain. And so these guys do have a third eyelid that comes across the top. And so I have to make sure that that's out of the way. 
And then we do have a bit of corneal edema. There's definitely some haziness to that eye. Just gonna put a little drop on there. And that's awfully thick, so we may need to use our saline. Let's see if we can do it from what we have. And so, oh my goodness, yes, you can see that big old stain uptake across a large swath of that eye. So we definitely have a big scrape on that eye, even with that thickness. Let's see the other one. Um, it doesn't show up on the camera, so okay. maybe describe what that looks like. Okay, yeah, so let's see what... This when you're done. Like. Sure, sure. Yeah. It is saline, so it's not a lot. It is saline, mm -hmm. okay, good. So we can always dilute it with that. All right, that's pretty thick. Let me try to drop a saline here that helps us visualize better. All right. A little, little one. All right. Down, see if this is more clear. Alright, so this eye does not seem to have any corneal defects. This eye, it definitely does. So there's a large, I don't know if it's going to show up on the camera, but there's a large trapezoid shaped scrape from about one third of the way from the midline all the way out to the edge. So when you point it towards his nose, it shows up a little bit. Like that? Uh, towards this way. This way? Um, and then up towards me. Mm -hmm. oh. Should for a second, but. Okay, so definitely, so we have a large corneal defect only on the right side. And so you have corneal edema on both, so there's definitely some inflammation on both. What are we using on this guy's eye right now? We have a floxacin and blood um, resorption. Okay, yeah, so we'll keep up with both. Um, and so floxacin is our biotic, and the fluoropropin is our anti inflammatory. So definitely based on that edema, we'll want to use both. So now we're just putting a drop in for medication. And so there we go. And then we'll go ahead and treat for our antibiotic as well. Wait until it opens up all the way. All right. So if you guys happen to be joining us for part of our treatment today, just the way the day flowed. And then is the anything else? Let's use six cc. You can pull it from that bag up there. Okay. All right. Syringes are over there. <laughs> okay. That was because that was the syringe I just used. It wasn't. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> we have a six cc. All right. So you guys are seeing a little bit of medical treatment today. So of all the animals that come into our care, maybe about. 25% uh, of them end up needing meaningful med medical attention. A lot of them are just orphans, um, but there are those that do need to be cared for. Um, so, one way that we keep our patients hydrated is by giving subcutaneous fluids. So I'm just going to grab up a amount of fluid for this little fella. And so, for subcutaneous fluids, you might have had this done before on a dog or cat that you own. In dogs or cats, the area where they have the loosest skin is going to be between the shoulder blades or interscapular area. And that is an excellent option for that species. However, with birds, they don't have a lot of loose skin in that location. And so instead, we use a different spot. We use their loosest area of skin, which is a little web in the leg pit area or inguinal. And so that's what we'll do for this guy. So for you to hold him steady, do you want to, are you okay standing? Do you want to be sitting? How are you going to most secure? Do you want to go here? Uh, grab a towel and throw it on the yeah. stool. Let's do that. All right. And so, again, this was not plan A today. We're just improvising because there's a lot going on. So we couldn't quite get everything ready before the live stream. So I hope you guys don't mind joining us. Got it. And so... Let's wet that area down with a little bit of alcohol. Yep, not going to be enough. Okay, sorry, buddy. A little bit more. There we go. And so with bird skin, when it is wet with alcohol, it will become transparent. There we are through all those feathers. And so this area of skin right here doop, is our loosest skin on a bird. So that is the area where... With us, our skin is so tight everywhere in the body, if we put a lot of fluid under the skin, it would stretch and hurt. 
but most some animals, such as birds and dogs and cats, have an area of loose skin where you can get that fluid in, and it naturally already is stretchy anyway. And so this is an alternative to having an IV line in. We could place an IV, but then the animal will have to be in a pump and ICU level care. Um, and so this way, we can give this amount of fluids, um, and it will be absorbed into the body over about six, eight hours to keep our patient hydrated. All right. Now, Western screech owls, they are very groggy during the day. They are a crepuscular species after that dawn of dusk. And so it's not unusual for them to be just kind of down and quiet uh, during the, this mid-morning timeline. Um, all right. So can you tell if we have any questions? <laughs> uh, we do not. Okay. So... All right, so welcome one and all. Um, thank you guys for joining us for our live stream Center County Wildlife Rescue. Uh, is it okay if I head on out? All right, so now we're going to move back towards Plan A uh, and take a look at what we have going on. So one of the focuses we wanted to mention today is skunks. And so skunks are uh, one of the more prominent, uh, visually prominent species that we have in our area. So I'm just going to walk all the way over to Bella. Okay. Um, and so skunks are scavengers, and so uh, they are going to eat a variety of different food. Uh, they are going to hunt a lot of small rodents, but they're also going to eat uh, fruits. They'll go for eggs, they'll go for berries, and things like that. Uh, and so skunks uh, are going to be, when you see them, it is amazing how long those front nails are. They are just voracious diggers. Uh, and so they will get down inside the ground, make big burrows. Uh, skunks are actually usually much, much smaller than most people imagine. Uh, they're much, for example, their weight is going to be half of that of a typical uh, small house cat. And so, you know, they're fluffy, they're big, and of course everyone's intimidated by their odor, but they are a pretty small and diminutive uh, species uh, once you have them, once you actually uh, compare them in, in actual size. Now, both the males and females do have that unique characteristic of the, the scent, the spray that they can produce, uh, and so certainly the, that is a modified anal gland, uh, and so that is a very potent scent. Uh, they cannot keep spraying forever. There's a limit in terms of how much spray a skunk can produce. Uh, and so, for the most part, skunks will reserve that spray until they're in truly desperate circumstances. Do we have... Four in there. Oh, there's, oh the, in here. Mm -hmm. All right, so there. we do have skunks of all different stages right now. Uh, and so we have some that are out and outside enclosures. We have some in what we call the nursery. We even have a couple in the hospital. And so we'll just Sorry. go take a look and see if we have a couple uh, that are in that midway point. Not yet ready for release, but out here in our outside enclosures. And hopefully they'll be, uh, we'll be able to see them. Now these are wild individuals. And so at this age, their behavior is, unpredict behavior is a bit unpredictable. Um, so we'll see if they're going to come up uh, towards us or not. And so... And as with most of our enclosures, we do have our double door system. So we can come on in and not risk the immediate escape. Oh yes, you can smell we got skunks in here. <laughs> and so let's go in and see if we can find our rehabbing individuals. And so this is a typical enclosure for a lot of our, uh, our mid-size carnivores. The gauge in this wire is such that it's only appropriate for certain species. And so we'll just check the den box, uh, see if they're lurking in there. And so you can see we have multiple food and water spots throughout. Um, skunks aren't usually very avid up on the high spots. Oh, I think I see them oh. up there. Yes. Absolutely, there's a couple over there. Let's take a peek in this box real quick as well. Nope. All right, so they do all seem over in that den area. Um, and so... <laughs> Well, I'll just lift that top wood so you guys can take a better peek at them. That top wood. And so skunks, when, they're, when they are younger and they're wanting to display it to kind of show just how big and powerful they are, they'll just stamp those two front feet. And you'll probably see that when we look at our younger size. The older size is a little bit unpredictable. Oh, yeah, you can see that back end is pointing towards us. And so those anal glands, they are not just going to be able to, they do not spray just in kind of like a poop or a cloud. They actually do have a fair degree of aim. And so they will actually, uh, the, it's almost like a little papilla, a little like finger like projection at the anal gland area where they will try to, to spray you directly in the face uh, when they get the opportunity. Uh, and so, 
All right, you can see just the tiniest last remnant of a little bit of color marking that we had used to tell these guys apart when they were smaller. Uh, for our animals, once they get to a certain size, we'll use microchips to identify them. Um, oh, you can see that stomping right there. That's that trying to, so you can see they didn't jump directly to spraying at us. And that would be typical. There's gonna be a whole sequence of events before they'd get to that degree. They're gonna start just by showing how impressive they are just by, by doing that stomp and, and try to intimidate us that way. They're also throwing that tail straight up and making that tail as big and bushy as possible um, just so that we know that they are skunked. And then if they feel much more threatened, if they feel truly endangered, then they'll spray. Uh, and so there's a whole sequence of events. And so they will try to give you the chance to back away before being before they'll release any spray. And so we'll go ahead and say, all right, you've intimidated us. That beastly stomp is sufficient. And so there you have some of our mid, uh, kind of teenager version of skunks. Um, and so uh, I hope you guys noticed those nails. So they will have really long nails. If you ever see the footprint of a skunk, they do have five toes like us. Um, they have a kind of a curved, almost like a big fat upside down smile of a pad and then five small little toes. And then if it's in mud, you'll also notice little pokes quite a distance out because they have such long nails for the digging that their footprint will have that poke as well. So a striped skunk is gonna be uh, a big fat jelly bean of a, of a carpal pad and then five little beans of a, uh, each digital pad. Uh, and so, all right, so that was our mid-sized skunk. Um, and so those individuals are on track to be able to return to the wild uh, later this summer. And so, as with every animal that comes into our care, by state law, where do we return it? To the immediate vicinity from which it was found. Uh, and so, uh, some, it's not an uncommon question for people to ask, can we just move it to some other location? Can we just relocate it? And the bottom line is, you know, the, there's not gonna be an area. So first of all, you're about movement of animals, movement of disease, that's a concern. Um, second of all, we just have our state law, we don't have a choice. But for biologic rationale, it makes no sense just to take a skunk a couple miles down the road um, because it's not like there isn't already gonna be a full population in that area. Uh, and so if there's an empty niche where that could support additional animals, including skunks, then that population would grow in that area. And so anytime, you, if you actually relocate an individual wildlife animal, all you're doing is forcing competition and you're gonna have a loser there. Uh, and so, the, uh, there isn't going to be just extra capacity, it's not just extra habitat waiting for you to relocate something that you found. If you do have a skunk under your home, absolutely, I can understand the distress and the, the risk of the scent. Uh, and so if there's an animal under your home, then even if you eliminate the individual, what's going to happen is the next season, you're just going to have another individual that's coming by. And so the only long-term solution is to modify the access to the structure so that the skunks don't keep on coming in. Now, there is ways to, to also encourage skunks to leave. And so you can use predator scents, um, uh, which would be, uh, which we actually sell here, which is in the form of some of the feces of the mountain lions or our bigger predators. Uh, and so you put that under your home, and then most of these mid-sized carnivores will take that as a signal that there's a bigger predator around and they'll leave. And that's very effective for, uh, more for some species than others, but that's an excellent option. Uh, now that doesn't last forever, that scent is only going to be potent for a couple weeks, so that gives you time to modify the area under your home until you can um, be able to exclude them from coming back. Now uh, another issue that we see with skunks is going to be people, they're so small, people will see the little burrows, see little access holes into their homes, and they'll think there's a rodent, they'll think there's a rat, and so they'll often place rat traps or snap traps. And if it's a skunk, what will happen is that skunk will still go for the food on that rat trap and they will get their paw snapped. And so every year we get quite a few skunks that were rat trap snapped. Uh, and so those are crushing injuries. Um, as long as the thumb and these two, uh, and at least one other toe is uh, viable on one hand and the full other hand is there, or kind of mix and match, you can lose a couple toes on each hand, then those skunks are still functional in the environment. They still pass all our all our um, assessments for release, um, but if they lose all of these digits on a paw, then there isn't really much we can do for them. Now, one time we had a owner who had a skunk under their house, they thought it was a rat, they caught the, the, the skunk by the, with a rat trap, and it was very muddy, it was very just kind of dewy underneath that house. And so when they tied a string to that rat trap and pulled it out because they were afraid to handle the skunk, 
And so we had the skunk come in just covered and crusted with mud. And so it was a very high stress situation. We didn't want to push the animal over the edge, so we waited till the next morning. And when we went by the next morning uh, when, to clean that individual off, we found we had not one skunk, but we had six skunks. That skunk had had a whole litter of offspring. And of those five babies, one of those babies was born with a defect to the tail so that only about 20% of the tail remained. And so only having a little bit of a tail isn't enough to cause that signal uh, to particularly protect you from all the other possible predators out there. And so therefore we couldn't release that skunk to the wild and here she is. And so this is Bella, uh, our permanent resident skunk. And so she uh, has been with us since she was born. And so if you, you can see her nails, uh, how long those front nails are as she comes up because these guys really are excellent diggers. And just to show, here's my hand kind of in comparison. And so if you want to zoom out just a second, you can see this skunk is just barely bigger than say two of my fists. And that is a full grown, full size skunks. skunk. So these guys really are much smaller than a lot of people imagine. Uh, with wildlife in general, people tend to just be, in, be intimidated and overestimate their animal size. But you can also imagine this animal is going to be able to crawl through a hole that is smaller than about half of my fist. And so they really, a lot of people do get the skunk burrows and the skunk access points confused for those with rodents because uh, they're more the size of what a lot of people imagine a larger rodent, a large rat to be. And so skunks will eat, like I said, they are omnivorous. So the kind of diets, the foods that we'll offer will include things like eggs. There will be some protein sources. There'll be some produce sources as well. Um, and so um, the, and so skunks, uh, they are illegal to have as pets in California. Um, of all the terrestrial animals, of the animals that are on land, they are uh, statistically going to be one of the, the main rabies vectors in California. And so that is true as a statistic. However, the amount of rabies we have in, in land animals in California is just a pale shadow compared to the number they have on the East Coast. And so while skunks are the most likely, it's still exceptionally rare. Um, it, over on the East Coast, the number of raccoons or even the number of cows that get rabies is much, much higher than it is here on the West Coast. Um, and so, um, but because of that rabies concern, they, uh, eat, they, it is uh, kind of under multiple le levels of legislation that it's not appropriate to have these guys as pets. Um, and in captivity, one of the biggest problems that are seen with captive skunks, and this would be true of skunks where people leave out pet food, is obesity. And so these guys will, they are tiny, they are really small, and so it doesn't take very many calories for them to get big and chunky. Um, and so it takes a lot of effort to keep uh, this captive skunk at a healthy, appropriate weight. Um, yes, the skin underneath that fur does have the black and the white, um, as, the, as the fur coloration does. Uh, in species that are, say, on the African savanna, like zebras, the skin underneath that will be all black with some white stripes of fur, but those animals are exposed to a lot more uh, high sun, high solar radiation type concerns. With these forest animals, often the skin underlying will match the uh, fur that you see above. Uh, all right, do we have any questions so far? Um, I believe I saw at least one. All right. Um, if a skunk with distemper sprays your dog, can the dog catch distemper if it's not vaccinated? Oh, okay, fair question. So certainly uh, distemper is a common uh, pathogen, a common virus in our environment, and yes, uh, it does affect the skunks. We're not 100% sure if the skunk distemper is going to actually be transmissible to canines in general, but even if it was, it is not a realistic concern from that method. The distemper virus would not be in the anal gland secretion itself. Uh, now, if the dog like went up close to the skunk and they tussled in other ways, that might be a more valid concern, but the spray, the scent itself, would not be a risk uh, for, the, for the disease. Um, and then this one came earlier, so I think we were up at those skunks, and it says, have you been sprayed by the skunk? And so I've been sprayed, so I have been fortunate, I have uh, not been sprayed in quite some time. However, as a veterinarian, I deal with things often after the care staff has already have them in hand. So they are taking the much bigger risk on that front. With the wild skunks, every year, yes, uh, it is just the nature of the game that a lot of our staff will end up getting sprayed. Um, once you have the skunk in hand, you can tuck the tail. You, there's a certain way you have to hold them, and so you have to make sure you're safe from getting bit. But you can, if that's controlled, you can tuck the tail underneath the skunk, and it won't spray on its own tail. So once they're in hand, there's ways to manage it. Uh, and then a number, and so with especially like all these rat 
trap injuries and other injuries, I've had to do uh, anesthetized procedures on quite a lot of skunks. And they don't just passively release that scent. So when they're sedated, they actually, well, you like can detect a bit of the musky smell. Um, they don't actively spray from the act of sedation itself. And so luckily that's not uh, a common occurrence uh, from the veterinary perspective. Um, but it is a very, very potent odor. There's no two ways around that. Um, and so uh, we'll go ahead and head uh, towards our younger and younger animals. We're gonna head towards the area we call the nursery. It's actually our first transition zone when animals are out of the hospital area, um, but not yet ready for the outside world. And so we'll see if those skunks are gonna show themselves for us or if they're just gonna stay in the den box. We'll uh, give them that option, being wild animals. Uh, but we'll see if, uh, how they'll show. And then we'll head on into the hospital um, where we have a whole slew of critters that have been coming in. Um, we have more foxes, we have more raccoons, we have more opossums, um, all coming in. So like I said, our orphans from the beginning of spring are starting to age, to graduate, and be returned to the wild, but we have just as many new animals coming in. Uh, some of them are the adult injured animals, like that western screech owl you saw, um, and some of them are going to be a lot of orphans, but still the majority of the patients we have coming through. Um, I can walk next to you if you want to. All right, yeah, so I can try to be backwards, uh, watching myself as close to you guys. Um, and so we'll swing up to the um, All right, so do, I mean, this is going to be a nice hot day today, so do make sure that you are staying safe. Uh, make sure you're leaving plenty of water out for your pets if they're outside. Um, and do be aware that if you have a water bowl outside, it's going to become a more and more precious resource to the wildlife that's around us. So never under any circumstance should you leave food out at night, but do be aware if you're leaving water bowls out, we're getting to the time of year where skunks, opossums, raccoons, maybe coming into your yard just for that water alone. And that will only become more and more so as we head through the heat and the longer heat of summer. And so be prepared for that human wildlife interaction if you're, or just take the precaution of removing those resources uh, when you step away. All right, so here's our nursery area. This is actually our mid-age transition spot. Right. So hello. Hi. Our friendly neighborhood interns are working hard. Um, we're just talking about skunks, and so we do have some of our mid-sized skunks, so we're just going to go show them off for a quick moment. Mm -hmm. All right, so I see, do you guys just clean and feed these guys? Yeah. Yep. All right, and so here we go with our next age down, and so you should probably be able to get close enough to get through those bars for the camera. Uh, and so you can see these skunks are indeed omnivorous, so we are offering them a variety of you got some chopped up rodents, you got different veggies, you even got a little bit of fruit. Um, in terms of, we will put some uh, different tree branches in there so they're exposed to that smell um, before they transition towards those outside enclosures. So these guys are not quite ready for the, if we move them outside too quick, um, they may not uh, be able to maintain weight, it may just be too, uh, too chaotic an environment for them when they've come in as delicate orphans. Of course, in the wild, they would have been from a more robust state if they didn't need our help to begin with. Um, and so these guys are well, only a week or two probably from being able to head outside uh, and grow and thrive uh, in one of those outside enclosures like the one we already visited. And so um, this is good appetite. I'm happy to see how, how, uh, how interested these guys are in the food that's being offered to them. And so at this age, um, they don't really have a targeted, uh, and certainly they can spray, but instead of being that targeted stream where they're gonna aim it towards you, if these guys were to spray, it'd be kind of more of an indistinct poop, kind of uh, not quite as potent a smell, still significant, um, but also definitely not as much of a targeted stream. They're still kind of developing and maturing to that skill. Oh, they noticed us. You can see that little stomp there. Um, oh, there's that other stomp. So you can see they're trying to, now they appreciate our presence, you can see that, that front leg or sometimes whole body stomp um, trying to let us know how intimidating they are. Um, and so I think we'll go ahead and listen to that stomp and let them have their meal in peace. All right, so we do have another uh, skunk or two that's in our hospital area. It's probably, based on, based on the look of those guys, it's probably about the same size. It just came in in rougher condition. So we'll check in on that individual too, as well as everyone else who is hanging out in the hospital. And so if you're interested in being an intern for us, uh, do, feel, do you know that we do have interns? We, uh, three, they're here three days a week. 
for a couple month stretch. Uh, and so we have a couple of rounds of interns, most commonly college students, but everyone is welcome. And so you can always contact us uh, if you're interested in that. It is, uh, you do need to be 18 or older. It's not, it is a, uh, not for uh, kids uh, opportunity. And so we're heading through our kitchen, our prep area. Um, our volunteers and interns already did that hard work of prepping most of the meals. Oh, still have some going on. Hey, Terry. All right, we got some ice cream ready. Oh my goodness, look at all these meals. We have a full day going on. Yes. So we're gonna just take a quick view of from above. And you can see some of the delicious food. Looks like we got some squirrel uh, nuts and whatnot going on. Is this for the hospital brew or the crew? I'm doing some for the nursery. Ah, for the nursery. Like the skunks we just saw. All right, this looks like it's probably for the hospital crew by the look of it. A lot of little opossum, finely chopped squirrel food as well. Okay, we're going to head on in to the hospital. Uh, and so, um, and so with uh, stones, it is not common to see them out and about during the day most of the time. That would be a sign of concern, except when it comes towards late summer when all those males who have been, um, the young males who are being displaced from their dens need to find new enclosures. And so sometimes in late summer, uh, in mid to late summer, early fall, you may see individuals trying to find their new habitat. Um, and so otherwise, if you see a skunk out during the middle of the day, you do worry. Could there be something going on neurologically? Could there have been trauma? Could there have been distemper? Or even possibly rabies? And so, all right. Well, hello. hello. We are doing our live stream, so we're coming by and taking a peek at what's going on. Okay. And so we do have one more skunk in here. And you can see we have lots of other critters. We've got plenty of raccoons and opossums. All right. How is this fellow holding up? Oh, all right. So this one is in a bit rougher condition, so we're keeping a closer eye on it. It's getting several different uh, medications to try to get it through. Um, so you can see it's not nearly as bright and robust and alert as those other ones we saw in the nursery just a couple moments ago. And that can happen just from being orphaned and being without nutrition for a while. There can be secondary conditions. I don't suspect a primary cause in this one, and so we have high hopes that I'll be able to improve out of it, but you never know. It could be that there is something like distemper lurking in there yet to emerge. It hasn't been here long enough to be certain. And so you may be hearing that chitter going on because we do have quite a few raccoons that have come in. And so we are kind of in the peak of our raccoon time of year in terms of those orphan raccoons making their way in. Um, uh, right. <laughs> so, uh, so this age is still very curious in the world. Uh, it is quite predictable. Uh, now, if you were to cuddle these guys, if you were to coddle them and treat them like a pet, then they would become fearless of people and that'd be a big problem. Uh, but even though they're very curious and inquisitive at this age, as long as we handle them appropriately, as they go through their maturation, they will be completely um, wild by the time they're ready uh, to return uh, out into the, their nat native habitat. Uh, and so we're not going to hold them or cuddle them right now because they are at an important stage of development. But um, the, but you guys, it does give you guys the opportunity to say hello to one of our juvenile um, raccoons. And there is a little bit of moisture on that, the bottom of his ventrum because these guys will tend to suckle um, uh, when they're orphans, uh, when they don't have their, their parents around. Um, but this is not getting to a dangerous state. This is not like those otters who need to have their... Um, they needed to have those cones. Speaking of the otters, I guess we can take a peek and see how the otters are holding up. All right. So every uh, animal, as I mentioned, has a four-digit letter code that we use to distinguish the species. River otters are, of course, a riot. And so we are going to take a quick peek. Oh, yes. Hello. And so it looks very satisfied. And so based on our timing, it would have been just past that meal like we saw. Um, with one of our recent live streams when we focused on all that care these guys need. Um, Katie, are either of these otters needing their cones anymore? Uh, or have they graduated out of that stage? They have not. I have them separated right now. Ah, uh, okay. Because of that. Because they chill out after their meal. Gotcha. Okay. So they still a bit uh, amped up from just getting fed. And so these river otters are still, well, they're, they're becoming more and more capable and functional by the day, they've still got a fair bit of development to go before they can transition to the den house, and then after that, teach them how to swim. So we got quite a bit of, of maturation to go. 
So we also ha happen to have a variety of different of our small rodents come in over this last week. So we have not only do we have our typical western gray squirrels, the most common squirrel we have around here, there's also a Douglas squirrel on hand, and even a ground squirrel. And so, <laughs> so just time for a routine change. And yes, we're still getting opossums. Oh, those opossums will keep strolling in all throughout um, uh, throughout the, the duration of spring, summer, and fall. Certainly we get those big waves in spring and our big waves in fall. Um, and so anything else that's a highlight to see in here, Katie, or that's about do. All right, so we're going to head on out. And so I hope you guys enjoyed. We had our spontaneous uh, bit of medical evaluation on that screech owl's eyes uh, before we headed on to check on the patients of the day, the skunks. And so we talked a moderate bit about skunks, about their omnivorous um, habitats, I mean, their diets, about their burrowing ha habitats, about their size, how they you know, often fit in things you'd think would only be... Um, be rodent size. I'm just going to end up in front of the map. Okay. Um, <laughs> the, um, the fact that they are such prolific diggers, uh, and so they really are an important parts of our native habitat. They are being a scavenger. They do help clean up uh, and take care of a lot of the different um, uh, nutrition that's around and available. Uh, and so they are part of the mix that we have. This is our map in terms of the intakes we get. And so we are, we've had about 400 animals come in so far this year. 550. I'm sorry, 550. Yes. Oh, that I was out of the office for a while. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, 550 animals in so far. So we are on track for a typical year where we will end up hitting uh, 1,400 or so animals over the course of a year. And so you can see they come from all over Sonoma County. These little blue uh, box circles are where we have our barn owl boxes as well. And so by the end of the year, this map will just be covered in these little stickers. Each color refers to a different kind of species that we have coming in. Uh, and so, if anyone's curious about this, we do also map it uh, on, uh, electronically. If anyone wants, just let us know, we can uh, make a, one of those Google Earth type maps. It's on the website. Uh, oh, it's already on the website. So you can see where everything's coming, and you can see the trends. So if you're curious, it's a great way to, the, the GPS is there for all the animals that come in. And so, any last questions before we head on out? We did have a few about skunks. Okay, please. Um, how long does a, um average healthy skunk live? Uh, and so skunk lifespan, ooh, in the wild it's going to be hard to say. Um, in captivity, um, they're going to make it towards double digits. They're going to make it um, uh, towards eight or so. Uh, in captivity, there are reports all over the map. Um, and so I would think they'd make it to the early teens and everything's ideal. Uh, but usually you're talking more um, towards eight, ten. Right. And why do skunks, skunks have stripes? Does it make them easier to camouflage or warn off predators? Excellent question. So as far as we understand it, it seems to be a distinct look so that they are recognized as skunks so that it is going to be a signal to predators. That's probably like the leading thought. However, with all of the animals that are in the riparian and the forested context, having different stripes and spots helps them blend in with the model pattern of sunlight as it comes to those trees. So that may be playing a role as well. Um, and then do you, what do you use to get rid of skunk smell? All right. Well, do you have a great answer to that one? Um, well, this one's specific to dogs, um, uh -huh. which I do not. But um, I've heard that if you have clothing um, that has been sprayed, laying it out in the sun for several days will help. Uh -huh. um, so I don't have great faith in the whole tomato juice theory. That one does not seem to hold true. Uh, and so I know we have on our website what the, the most effective uh, recipe has been in the past. So I'll have to check updated. But I believe there is a, a baking soda version on that. Uh, one second. Let's check with someone who's been sprayed before. Okay. Megan, yeah. what is our current recommendation for skunk smell removal if you get sprayed? Or your dog. Or your dog. Uh, well, online, there's like a combo. It's, um, I think it's dish soap, peroxide, and something else. So and we have it on our website. I don't know if it's on the website, but if you just look up skunk removal, then uh, it's All right. Well, we'll make sure, I'll make sure to add that as a comment to this very live stream uh, since, since we seem to be... Gotcha. Since we seem to be uncertain at the moment, there's lots of recipes out there. I'll have to look at our records on which one actually. Megan just mentioned one was at Petco, though, um, um, for dogs. Yeah. So there is a combination of soap, and I thought it was some baking soda, but it could be some peroxide. So have to look that one up for you, but there are multiple options. Part of the reason why we don't have, like, one here's the best is because there are several options that work. Um, and then do you need previous experience to intern? As an intern, you do not need to have previous wildlife experience. Now, we do open up internships a couple times in the year, so we do have a, like an early a spring, summer one, and then a summer, fall one, usually time to hit both the semester system break and the uh, quarter system break. 
Um, but uh, we do have some folks who want to come in later in the fall as well. Uh, and so, no, you do not need to have previous uh, experience to enter. All right. So thank you guys so much for joining us. Stay cool, stay hydrated, stay safe. Um, and see you next week from Sonoma County Wildlife Rescue.